This man would have died if the recovery rope that failed hit him two inches to the left. In this video, I'm going to have a good chat with Caleb, who survived this incident when a kinetic recovery he was doing failed. To do this content justice, it is a longer video. So grab a coffee, get comfortable, and let's hook into it. So Caleb, mate, uh, you just had one hell of an experience, <laughs> and I'm sure you wouldn't wish it on anybody. I mean, it's just wonderful that you're, um, you're alive to tell this story, but I've been preaching for years, recoveries are dangerous and we need to take them with great, uh, great care and consideration. Do um, you want to tell us a little bit about just briefly what happened to you the other day? It was what, a week ago or something, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was last Friday on the, the 23rd over here in California. And we were out snow wheeling. I was taking my Bronco group up to see some snow and uh, just kind of get their feet wet with some snow wheeling. A lot of them are newer guys and gals. And I decided to hang up in the back and kind of throw the drone up. My friend was flying the drone out of the back, uh, passenger seat of my Bronco and we were hanging back and I started to you know, have some fun in the snow and uh, got stuck in a snow bank. A Jeep was behind me, so I just asked them to give me a quick pull instead of having my friends come back up. Long story very short, during the recovery, my soft shackle snapped and the kinetic rope came through my window like a bullet. The knot loop end of the rope hit my shoulder, traveled past me, shooting out like a rocket through the top of my Ronco. And as it shot past me, the length of the rope was rubbing along my neck at whatever speed that was. It rubbed off multiple layers of skin right here and then up to my ear. And then something split the top of my neck below my chin open pretty deep and uh, uh it got intense real quickly after that <laughs> long story right. short yeah um, look i'll link people to the video you just put up on your channel um which is uh popo patty um so i'll have a link to that and uh you totally spent about an hour unpacking this whole scenario and going right through it so i'll leave people to watch that video and get your raw insights it's quite a raw video that you uh, shared but what i want to do in this video is really spend the time to just talk through with you some of the considerations that i've observed when i've watched that video now i am extremely aware that i wasn't there and that the information i'm working on to make is i'm, I'm making a lot of assumptions but I think we can do this and still all learn and raise awareness of how recoveries should work. So if it's all right with you, that's what I'd like to do is just really focus on what can we learn out of this really negative situation that happened to you. Yeah, and that's that's my goal. I'm an open book. I'll fall on my sword. I made mistakes and I want other people to learn. We all make mistakes and we oftentimes get to learn from them. And none of us are immune from that. And I know for myself, I have made mistakes and later gone, wow, I was looked after in that moment. And uh, so, you know, I, I think it's a fool that will slander somebody for making a mistake, but it's a fool that le doesn't learn from the mistake. So, you know, let's all learn from this. And that's that's what we want to do in this video. Let's just walk through the, the, the process. So the first thing that happens, you've got yourself bogged. I am not an experienced snow wheeler. We have snow in Australia, but nothing like what you guys get. So when you get stuck in snow, my understanding is that the moment you wheel spin, you pretty much turn the snow to ice and you get zero traction. Is that correct? It really depends on the kind of snow, but on, on a baseline and the kind of snow we are wheeling in, as soon as your wheels start spinning, you sink. We were on about, at that point, about three feet of snow and there's packed snow under the new fresh fluffy snow. And so once your wheels start spinning, your whole chassis just starts slowly sinking down and then you're done. So, so in that situation, can you use things like tread boards, traction boards and things like that to, or are they not really so effective? I personally haven't had good use with them in the snow. We actually tried earlier in the day and we snapped them in half. Uh, right. We just, we tried them just for fun and they, they yeah. did not work. Were they a brand name product? The I, don't, I, don't, I really don't know. I don't carry them. And so it was someone else's that they brought and out. The brand I use is called Tread, Tread Pro. I believe they're fairly represented in the, in the US and uh, they have a cold rating 
because some of the, the, the products out there, that, especially the cheaper brands, the plastics that they're formed from don't mould to the um, in the cold environment. So they become brittle and they fracture. So I believe the name brand products are really good in that in that sort of scenario and, and are probably worth the investment. But again, I don't have snow wheeling experience effectively. And I've been doing kinetic recoveries for years and uh, I never understood in my mind because I've never seen it talked about personally. And that's, and probably just haven't sat down and thought about it because any simpleton that looks down and fits, thinks about it will probably understand it. Uh, how much energy can be stored in those kinetic lines? I, I've always assumed that if something broke, it'd come back, make a dent in the car, bounce off the hood, something like that. Never in my life did I imagine that a rope would go through a windscreen. Yeah. There's, it's not uncommon at all. Um, here in Australia alone, we only have a population of like 26, 27 million people. So quite a small com population compared to the US. We have multiple people per year killed from kinetic style recoveries. And exactly what happened to you, um, it was about a year or two ago, a guy called Ryan died in a kinetic recovery over there in the US. It was because I used a tow hitch and the, oh, the yeah. And, you know, Ryan was just a family man out going for a day wheel and he died from the scenario that you're, you've been exposed to. Fortunately, <laughs> praise the Lord, you're a survivor. <laughs> um, so we can have this conversation. It's really terrifying. And one of the great frustrations is sharing with the community the danger in kinetic recoveries. Um, to give you a concept, many of us who I associate with um, in, the, in the game, we don't do kinetic recoveries very often. I think the last kinetic recovery I did in anger, uh, you know, and that means outside of demonstrating it for videos that I'm filming, mm -hmm. would be about two years ago. Oh, well. And I do an awful lot of forward driving. I'm doing the winch recoveries quite regularly. But a winch recovery is so much safer. And the reasons for that is we, we've got an on-off switch. If we see something going wrong, we can turn the winch off, we can turn the winch on. The winch also has two natural fuses. One is electrically, you can run out of power. Um, or, or <laughs> um, electrically, we run out of power or the, the winch just stalls. And so there's two natural fuses within the system. So, and plus it's slower. So there's lots of the real advantages to a winch recovery. So when, um, when you were out on the track, this other guy turned up, did you know him? No, not personally. Uh, we had, he had passed us earlier on the trail and he had been driving behind us on our way back out. But other than that, didn't know him. Okay. So, um, so he obviously like any good wheeler would do, he's offered to help. Yeah. And he yeah. seemed very experienced and knowledgeable as far as I could tell. Yeah. A lot of the guys out there in those kind of rigs that he had are guys that hit the Rubicon all the time. And that's the vibe I got from him. And it ended up being true because we talked since and he is a Rubicon guy. Yeah. How does he feel about what went on? We haven't talked about that specifically. Yeah. What's your thoughts about um, being in charge of the recovery? How do you see that scenario? Typically, I'm the one doing the polling, and I've always, as the person that polls, been the one in charge. So, for, for that situation specifically, I would have probably, I should have still been in charge, mainly because I was the one hooking up, I was the one asking for the poll, I was the one that knew how stuck I was, I had more information. So I should have conveyed that. And also because like, I didn't know him, there should have been that communication and that was on me. Did you have UHF communications between you both? UHF? Uh, radio. Oh, uh, radio. no, it was literally just, he came up and I'm like, Hey, can you give me a tug? And he's like, yeah, I got you hooked up. Thumbs up. Yeah. Job done. Yeah. Yeah. I always like to encourage people to, well, at the end of the day, I, I say there's got to be somebody in charge of the recovery. So I figure that the vehicle that's stuck, the driver of that vehicle, let's make them the in charge of the recovery. Now, obviously, they can delegate that. So 
what I'll do if I come into a situation and let's say you were bogged and I just come along, I'll come to you and say, so are you in charge of this recovery or would you like me to be in charge of it? You know, so you, then you can delegate the responsibility to me to, to run it and manage it. Um, and then I'd also, you know, we also here in Australia, it's very common to have radio communications with the two vehicles so that, Same here. Um, yeah, so that way, you know, we can communicate, hey, man, don't, don't hit me any harder, you know, don't, don't do another hit that hard, can you back it down a bit, or I'm going to jump out and, and reduce that recovery load by digging out that front right wheel or whatever, um, as, which you identify in your, your video. And it's something that I commonly practice. I even carry extra radios to hand to people when I'm doing them. Right. I, but like I said in the video, rushed mindset, skipping steps like I shouldn't have. Do you, is there one single thing that you think was the biggest single mistake you made in that whole recovery? Sorry to interrupt the video. I've been creating online four-wheel drive training content for the last 10 years, but I'm not helping as many people as I want to. So I'm creating an online four-wheel drive training course. So if you'd like access to some free and exclusive training videos, click the link in the description and register your interest. All right, let's get back to the video. Absolutely Russian it. Russian. So, yeah, I, I, yeah so getting That's lost in the me. moment. Just, yeah, it caused me to, I was skipping steps. I wasn't thinking about things like I usually do. I was mm. just complacent, done this 200, 100 times, however many times, and I'm just, Easy peasy, let's go, get it out. Yeah. So, Caleb, what um, what equipment were you using to perform the recovery? So, on the Bronco side, I had a, uh, a 3.8 soft shackle rated to 43,500 pounds max braking strength. That's the only rating on it. It was a USA-made shackle, mm -hmm. and it was looped through a D-ring attached to a bumper clevis. And then I had a one inch by 30 kinetic rope uh, made overseas that was rated to 33,000 pounds, max braking strength, no further details on strength. And it was said to have a 30% stretch. And then on the Jeep side, I had a Amazon brand soft shackle no idea where it came from. And looking back at the, the, the shackle online now, it actually has two different ratings on the site. It says 55,000 pounds max braking strength. And then if you scroll down, it also says 38,000 pounds max oh, braking nice. strength. So you get to choose. So I guess you get to choose. And then I found the same right. shackle, same company listed elsewhere. And it had totally different ones. One of them said 63,000 pounds, same shackle, same company. Right. And that was a half inch shackle and it had a sleeve around it as well. Right. And that was mounted through the clevis itself, the eyelet on the bumper, which was about a little over an inch wide. And it wasn't like razor sharp edges. They were rounded, but they're really, uh, really, um, they weren't a large radius. Sure. Sure. So they didn't have the right bend radius for no. the, for the fiber. Correct. Yeah. So, um, was there a reason you didn't go for a bridal recovery? Do you know what I mean by that yeah. terminology? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, right. I, would, I would think that looking at the front of your vehicle, a bridal on the front of yours and a bridal on the back of the other vehicle would have been a mm -hmm. good setup. Yeah, it would have been a great setup. And uh, there's, there's two reasons. Uh, one, again, complacency, rushing through it and just thinking like this is gonna be an easy tug and we're out. And then just something that comes to mind is a long time ago when I was first starting out, I did a bridal setup and someone was like, someone that I really respected and had a lot of experience told me, you're just wasting time with the bridal. You don't need that. And yeah, ever right. since then, uh, I've actually, uh, on me is, I've been like, okay, well, I guess it's, it's fine without a bridal, but obviously not. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the simple fact of the matter is that a bridal has some disadvantages, but generally speaking, you're halving the load. So each recovery point now only has to do half the work. Right mm -hmm. there is is a significant thing. Plus, you've now got, you'd have, in your situation, you would have had two soft shackles sharing the load, not just one. 
Talk to me about the recovery rope. So that was a one inch rope yeah. rated to 30% stretch, but it stretched to 30% at what load? Do you know? That's, that's the question. It's not listed on the site. I actually know the company, not super well, but I've talked to the owner. It's a small company and really nice guy. But looking back now with all the other intel that's flooded in to me since this event, all the stuff I just didn't know about before, I just straight up didn't know, never seen it, never come across it, is, is that uh, one inch is probably too big for my vehicle. And it, because of the weight of my vehicle, it doesn't allow that full stretch. I did the math and it was roughly, I think, nine feet of stretch that it was supposed to stretch. And then looking at the video, it looked like maybe two tires lengths, which is from the video, it was hard to tell, but anywhere between three and four feet is what it actually stretched. Maybe that, maybe less. And then uh, the, the other thing I didn't think about too was the rope doesn't list the working load. It's, it's just something I wasn't aware of at the time. And then the other thing that the, uh, on the website where I bought the rope from, it says good for vehicles up to 11,000 pounds. So in my mind, I'm good. It says it's good for my range of vehicle. Right. Yeah. Back in, I think there's something that's developed with the development of recovery ropes. And I'll say this, if, if I have to choose between a snatch strap and a recovery rope, I will definitely do a recovery rope. I did a video with Matt from Matt's Off-Road Recovery when I was over in Utah um, there a few years back. And we, we, he, I knew snatch straps, he knew recovery ropes, and we didn't know the other. And so we did this comparison together, which was very interesting. And I'm definitely a fan of the recovery rope over the strap, because yeah. primarily because a strap has a designed in fuse point at the end of the transition of the eye stitching they will always fail at that point. And I don't like the idea of a device having an intentional failure point. And recovery ropes don't have that, which is, which is, in my opinion, a great thing. But there's obviously other considerations, which I won't go into in this video. But with snatch straps, we have a principle that we call, say that you use a snatch strap that is rated at two to three times the weight of the lightest vehicle in the recovery. So let me try and do some math on the fly here. So let's say we have a vehicle that weighs one ton. Two times that is, is two, uh, two tons. Three times that is three tons. So I would want a snatch strap that's rated between two and three tons to recover that vehicle. And it's regardless of that's the lightest vehicle in the recovery. So that's like we're talking a really small vehicle at one ton, obviously. But if you that's how we used to rate snatch straps. I've not seen that information come across to the recovery ropes, but I think that recovery ropes would subject themselves to a pretty much the same principles. And I've actually had this conversation with, um, with Justin at factor 55 about their recovery ropes. And, um, and, and it's like, I think that we need to see some form of, rating that helps people make sure they're using the right tool for the right job because if if you have a rope that's suited to your vehicle but somebody comes along in a much heavier four-wheel drive to recover you which rope are you going to use you need to know that information so you're choosing the right tool for the job because here's the thing and matt and i found this when we did the test the one inch recovery ropes will stretch to 30% when you've got the right rated vehicles involved. But when you don't, they won't stretch to 20, 30%. They'll stretch closer to 10, 15%. Mm -hmm. And like I'd say, you've found. And why that's a problem is that it doesn't allow time in the recovery for the energy to be, or the rope to be charged. A rope, there's a misconception that the recovery ropes and kinetic devices are creating energy they're not they're storing energy they're working like a battery so the energy is all created by the vehicle that's moving and doing the recovery and then the rope is storing the energy until that it's charged and that's when it pulls the vehicle out or something fails so if you don't have the right percentage of stretch you you charge the battery effectively the rope too fast Hmm. which is kind of like taking a hammer and hitting something. You, 
if you hit something, you shock load it and you get a more dramatic effect. When you put that same pressure on over time, you get a more a, a softer, gentle effect. And that's the beauty of having that 30% stretch is it allows us to charge the battery over a slightly longer period of time. And that's one of the reasons that they're safe, but you've got to have the right rated device for that to work. Yeah. And this is one of the concerns I've been having along with a few others um, with recovery ropes in the industry is that they're actually, generally speaking, too big for the job that we're using them for. So if anybody in the recovery rope industry is listening to me now, reach out and, and let's have a chat about this. Let's get this sold so that the community is safer because I don't need anybody getting killed by these devices out there in the community. And I'm so grateful you're still with us. <laughs> oh, so, well, mate. I bet scare. you are. It was a scare for a second, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, I like I believe that people are going to watch this this interview and watch your story and it is going to save lives categorically 100 percent, it's going to save lives because people are going to watch it and go well i didn't know now i know and they're going to change their ways and i i just love seeing four drivers that genuinely don't know but they learn and they take it on board mm -hmm. that they, they, these those people are heroes of mine because they're prepared to learn there's a principle that i teach and it's called the hierarchy of recovery this was created by a friend of mine, John Eggenhausen, and I love it because it basically looks at recovery from the safest to the most dangerous. I'll cover this off in my YouTube videos, but basically it's like we start with the most simple things, like are we in four-wheel drive? Have we got our tyre pressures set correctly? Um, and then we look at escalating it to the next level which is still safe which is can we use a shovel can we use traction boards can we use um you know jacking the vehicle up what can we use that to, to get the vehicle out under its own steam and they're really nice low level recovery methods you can get the kids involved they're that safe um and and then if that's not working we can then escalate it to what we call a tow recovery and which is looks exactly the same as a kinetic recovery, which is what you guys performed, but it doesn't involve the momentum. And then if a co-recovery doesn't work, we then look at winch recovery. Now, m most of the time I've found that everything can be recovered with a winch. Um, yeah. And after a winch, if you go, it's not going to work, which generally speaking is is those environments where there there aren't anchor points well you you, you in your situation you had an anchor point because you had another vehicle um so but a beach or wide sand dunes can be an issue where finding an anchor point can be a challenge not, although not impossible and so that's where we go to the situation where we go and have a um a, a kinetic recovery which is what you guys performed and that's where we actually use the momentum of the vehicle i'm going to get a graphic which i'll put into the final edit here which a friend of mine robert pepper uses and it's a graph that actually shows the energy that's developed in a kinetic recovery and to be honest, it's absolutely terrifying. And it's the root cause, in my opinion, of what went wrong for you guys So, in your, in your recovery. So think of it like this. Um, and I'm not a scientific guy. I'll, I'll link Robert's video to better explain this because it's really important we understand it. But if you think about your ve a vehicle that's traveling at two kilometers or two miles per hour for you guys, at traveling at two kilometers per hour and let's just say hypothetically it generates one ton of force in that at two, two, two kilometers per hour that one ton of force is applied through the kinetic rope to your vehicle and that's what tries to do the recovery well great if it doesn't do the recovery we increase the speed now one would think that if i increase the speed by um to um <laughs> Hello. I have kids at home. <laughs> You're right. Um, so one would think if we increase the speed to four kilometres per hour, so we double the speed, that we're going to now generate two tonnes of force. We're not. We're actually going to generate four tonnes of force because it's compounded. So if we go four kilometres per hour to eight kilometres an hour, we're not generating four tonnes of force now. We're generating four times four. 16 tons of force so every time you double your speed you quadruple the amount of energy so you can very quickly see 
why the first recovery you guys did survived. Obviously, the recovery equipment has been exposed to, um, to stress under that moment, but it survived. But when old mate went for it and sent it that much harder, the amount of force that you've applied to the now compromised recovery kit is way beyond what any of that gear could ever take. So even though you were using rated gear, I think if we did the numbers, if we knew what speed that vehicle was traveling when, he, when the rope started to take up, you'd understand that we exceeded the, the working load limit of all of the recovery gear. That's a really terrifying concept. I think, you know, that was one factor that, I would like people to really understand is that kinetic recoveries, although effective and can be done safely, we really need to keep the vehicle speeds right down low. There were two failure points on each side of the rope, but the one that completely failed was the soft shackle mounted through the clevis on the Jeep side. Okay. So what was the second one? We'll come back to the soft shackle. The second one was my bumper well, my frame and my bumper itself, the recovery, the actual metal recovery point. And I think this is a, a fact that got skipped over a lot in my video, which is why I want to talk about it too, uh, mainly because my video was so long and people didn't like that. Um, ah, well. <laughs> uh, I wanted to tell the full story. Anyway, um, so on my Bronco, there's the frame horn with the three bolts going through it. And then the bumper is bolted to the two frame horns. There is a bracket that is mounted into the three bolts going through the frame horn. And that bracket is bolted through. It's like an L. And then the end of the L, there's an angle piece of steel that comes out and goes forward. And the clevis, a uh, thick piece of steel, slides in through the outer shell of the bumper into that bracket. And it's bolted with two bolts that go through the clevis into that bracket. And on the aftermath when I'm going over my bumper, multiple things happened. The bracket bolted into the frame horn, bent out almost two inches. Wow. And the L shape where it's coming from that bracket over to the clevis, sheared 90% of the way through 3 16th steel. And then the two bolts that went through the clevis going into the rest of the bumper structure, two massive grade eight bolts, they got pulled out of their threads. And then the clevis, went forward about two inches into the 3 16th steel outer shell of the bumper and pulled that whole assembly out about half inch. And then my frame horn twisted out and the entire bumper pulled out about half inch to an inch and a half, somewhere on there. That's just phenomenal. The amount of damage. Has it actually bent the, the frame of the Bronco? So it, I think it's like Jeeps too. It's similar where... My other Jeep is an XJ, so I don't have a frame, but I think other Jeeps are similar where it's the frame horn. The frame comes out from the vehicle, and then there's a flat plate at the end that you can bolt your bumpers to. And mm. the horn, which is just curved steel around the edge of the frame, twisted around the frame itself. Mm. So as far as you know, the, the chassis of the Bronco is still parallel because I've, yeah. seen, I've seen them, not in Broncos, but uh, it was a Nissan Navara where the chassis rails actually went out of parallel across the whole length of the vehicle so yeah uh it's not at the frame shop yet but it should be straight uh this happens a lot on the broncos have actually happened to me once from a frontal impact not a pull where the horn just bent around the frame sure yeah well i guess that's again where using a bridle is going to be helpful because we're going to share that load across the frame better so yeah um so with the soft shackle I found it really interesting watching your video of that and unpacking where the soft shackle failed because I didn't actually expect it to have failed there. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Component? Yeah, uh, this is the, the charged topic that everyone's talking about too. Um, I'm an open book for opinions. I don't know what failed. I only have my perspective. And looking at the freeze frames of the actual break right after it happened, when it's still coming out of the Jeep end, the soft shackle, when I put the soft shackle all through the clevis, it was in the sleeve. The sleeve was through the clevis and the loop was about halfway in between both connection points, almost halfway. It was a little bit more towards the, uh, the rope side, I think, but I'm just sure. trying to remember. And then 
when it failed and I'm inspecting it afterward, the sleeve is not torn. Did the sleeve stay in the clevis? That's what I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know that. Um, I, no one on scene remembers that I'm aware of. We just don't know. Just an unknown. The, when it pulled out, you can see the knot of the soft shackle coming off with the rope. And there's no longer the loop around that knot. And my assumption is that if it's sheared at the clevis because of the diameter cutting it, then I would assume that that split second right there, there wasn't enough time yet for that loop that would now be very tight around that knot to get flung off. And that's like fractions, fractions, milliseconds after the break had happened. So my opinion is the loop broke that was going around the knot. Mm. Now, whether or not that's because it was cut somehow or it was damaged from the radius or some other factors that I'm sure you're going to bring up, uh, I don't know. I, I think when I saw the soft shackle in your video, it looks to me like the eye of the soft shackle is where the break is. And if yeah. it breaks there, the soft shackle is going to let go of itself. If the soft shackle had cut because of the clevis, we would have the eye still on the knot and there would be a clear cut point in the, in the fibers of the soft shackle, even if the outer sheath survived. I think I, I tend to agree with you that it wasn't the clevis that caused the soft shackle to be cut. And I see a lot of commenters, commenters are saying that's what happened. And at the end of the day, we're all guessing. There's nobody who knows yeah categorically this is precisely what happened and i'm not saying that i do either but trying to subjectively look at the information on hand i think i agree that the eye of the soft shackle has failed and the only the only thing i just wanted to bring to people's awareness as a consideration as to what may have happened and again i, d I don't know but when we're working with soft shackles and fiber recovery devices, which I am a huge fan of, I much prefer them over metal, but we do have a heat component and this is not often understood. So I see this in my racing, um, you can see behind me a picture of my race car. When we're doing racing in that environment, at times when we have a high load uh, recovery environment, you can actually see the fibers of a, of a recovery device melt. So yeah. if you imagine the weave of the soft shackle, when it's loose, they're quite loose, but when they all of a sudden have to tighten up, they're under such extreme load that they will actually get hot enough to actually melt those fibers. Oh, yeah. So, I've seen it. Yeah, it, right. And, and I think it, you know, most people listening to this will probably have seen it too if they've done a bunch of wheeling and recoveries. I wonder if you've had the first hit, the soft shackle would have gone tight at that point. It may have subjected to heat or whatever, but by the time you come to another recovery, it, that heat's gone. But if the if we've got the, the the knot here and the loop around there, that may well have come loose a bit and that everything's relaxed. Then he's gone for the second hit. And in the moment where that's really tightened up, we've we've not only subjected it now to some frictional heat, we've also subjected it to an extreme amount of load. And basically an Amazon soft shackle is not as good as a high quality soft shackle. And once again, in my book, when it comes to kinetic recovery, any recovery really, but especially kinetic recovery, we cannot compromise with cheap and nasty equipment. It, it's just, it, it's biting us and it's biting people. And we've got to get that message out there. So I wonder if, it was, it was not only being overloaded, but also there was a heat component to that failure in the eye as you address. Yeah, yeah. possibly, possibly, very likely. Uh, I know looking back at the video when the Jeep backed up to, it grabbed hold of the rope and it pulled it really tight briefly because he ran over the rope that he might have drawn it in against the edge and maybe added a little slice to it somehow there. I feel fairly comfortable that it, that it wasn't the clevis that caused the failure because uh, I think the soft shackle demonstrates that the eye failed. 
um, and that wasn't in the clevis. So yes, that would be a consideration. It's worth knowing about. You don't drive over your recovery gears, you know, stop, get the rope out of the way. But again, when you're rushing, these are this is where we make these sort of mistakes. And, and I didn't, and also like, I didn't even know he had run it over until I watched the drone footage. Sure. sure. I was still recovering from the first pull. I was like, whoa, that was, <laughs> and I look over and my buddy's like, wow. And I was like, yeah, and then he's already yeah. back. But, I know this is an impossible question to sort of answer, but do you, do you reckon you could have a rough idea of what sort of miles per hour he was doing on the first hit and maybe on the second hit? See, that's the thing too, because I'm going off a of feeling. All right? I've been pulled out with a kinetic a lot. We use a kinetic a lot in the US, like a lot. It's gotten mm. really, really popular. We know. Um, yeah. <laughs> and... Um, the being on the receiving end of getting pulled out a lot of times i have never felt a jolt like that but looking at the drone footage it didn't look really fast so i i really don't know like i remember hearing it it was like it was mm. revving up and it was the tires were kind of spinning and it caught traction and it went um i can't really 10 yeah. maybe yeah right. 15, I, yeah. But it's so to give you an idea, I teach um, that the maximum speed you will do a kinetic recovery is ten kilometers per hour. So miles per hour is uh, which way is it? Hundred hundred kilometers an hour is sixty miles per hour. So um, it's yeah, so it's lower. So yeah, six. so yeah, six miles per hour. That's about the maximum you're going to do a kinetic recovery. And think back to what I was saying about that sliding scale. So if he did the first at say 10 um, and the, the, uh, the second at say 15, um, we're starting to get some serious energy generated. You can actually, and, and maybe this would be a conversation you could have with the, the fellow at some point is, what gear was he in in his vehicle and roughly what RPM was he at? That will give you a rough indication of what speeds he was doing. So you can you can actually kind of work that out yourselves, um, and you know get a sense of that, and then you know give it to a better mathematician than me, and they'll be able to work out those those kinetic loads that you were generating. And all I can say is it'll sit on the back of your seat as to oh my god that's so powerful, so much energy yeah. being generated here in Australia. This is it's it's interesting seeing the US wheeling mindset versus the Australian mindset. And uh, I've, I've been to the US a few times and I've been to King of the Hammers and I've done those, been to those events. And, um, and I see the, the, um, the American wheeling concept and I agree with it to a point is you drive everything. You, you do not pull the winch because when you pull winch, you, you, you're admitting failure. You're admitting that you've reached the end of your skill set. Whereas in Australia, yeah. we see winch <laughs> as, as a legitimate part of our our recovery methods and, and part of our process. So we have no shame in pulling winch. We'll, 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 we will drive with technical four wheel driving right into the, into, the, into the space. You know, like we're cool to go as hard as you can, but then we pull winch and we go. And, and there's a very different mindset to winching, but, but this is where the, in my opinion, the American US market is opening themselves up to to these dangers is because they've just got a negative attitude towards that winching procedure, which is at the end of the day, a very effective and, and, uh, and, and uh, procedure that should be in any, every four wheel driver's arsenal. And the cool thing is every, every modified vehicle has got a really nice worn or something on the front end of it with it never vehicle. gets used. Yeah. It never gets used. It's got all the, all the factor five jewelry on the front there. Like, and it's like, man, and, and it's like, I ain't using that thing. That's my, that's my, that's my golden ring and that's my jewelry. <laughs> and that's just going to sit there and look real cool. You know, I was like, guys, pull that out, man. That's just, there's so much cool arsenal you can use with a winch to do really cool stuff. And we, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. It. Yeah. What are you going to do differently when you go wheeling next time? I've completely changed it up my equipment. So I actually had already started to change up my equipment. I just happened to grab that one shackle because it was right there. I was like, all right, let's go. Um, and so I'm changing all my equipment over, probably going to a very good brand that um, we've been talking about in this video. Uh, I've been talking to actually someone about like 
what equipment to get and what the right stuff is. And he's made some really good recommendations. So I'll probably go with some, not to put down Australia, but some USA stuff. <laughs> um, I, I, I love the Factor 55 kit. That's what I use. Definitely switching up a lot of my stuff, going with a skinnier rope. I still have the one inch. Uh, the company actually wanted my rope back so they could see what effects their pull had on it, which I thought oh, was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And they sent me out a replacement, same rope. So I'll keep that one for when I need a one inch rope. But for most of my stuff, I'm going to go back to a seven eighths. I'm going to do a lot more winching. Uh, I'm going to make use of much better quality soft shackles. Cause I still am a fan of soft shackles, even after this experience, like, cause I know if it had been a metal thing that failed or if the reverse had happened and my metal clevis had gone to his Jeep, totally different story. Terrifying. Yeah. So better yep. soft shackles. I'm going to have that mindset of like, all right, I'm stuck. We get out, assess, look after the first pull. If I had looked out onto that passenger side, I would have seen I'm no longer in my tracks. I'm sunk. So I'm going to totally change up my approach, my gear, probably replace my winch line too because my winch line is pretty old and it's synthetic. It's a worn line, but it's it's old. And I was looking at it and I'm like, this thing is melted in a few spots. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Are you going to start using bridles, sharing that recovery load? Yep, bridles, both points. Uh, I use a, I use the Factor Fifty Five Tree Saver, or we call yep. it Tree Trunk Protector, but Tree Saver as a bridle because um, they 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 uh, Tree Trunk Protectors have that beautiful sheath right the way along it, mm -hmm. and and uh, the, talk to Justin as well. They have an excellent tow rope um, in their Bora recovery kit. You can buy the whole kit, you know, it's, it's cost some dollars, but Jesus got some good gear in there, Crosby shackles, all that good stuff. But the, they have a, a rope designed for towing and it's mm -hmm. just a beautiful piece of kit. Is there anything else you'd like to close this off with? And I think a huge takeaway that's often overlooked too from the whole thing is having the right kit, medical kit, and then knowing how to find it and where and how to use it as well as some way of emergency communications is very key as well. If you do have to get life flighted or something else, mm -hmm. God forbid happens. Uh, I was already kind of preaching it before and I'm just more firm in my mind. Now you have to have that medical kit. You have to know how to use it. And anyone has to be able to walk up to your vehicle and find it without asking you where it is. I actually have to say that was one thing I, you challenged me on and I'm going to go and change up my setup. So I got the gear in the vehicle, but I, I loved your point. You said you first aid kit where you can look through any window and you will see that first aid kit there. It's obvious. And I thought, wow, that's, that, uh, that's a really cool idea. Cause for me, I just have it in the car and I sort of know where it is, but I never really thought about other people being able to find it easily. And so that, thank you for, for that tip for me. I'm going to definitely change up that scenario for us. I, I think my biggest thank you to, to you is thank you for putting yourself out there because I know that you'll get me getting hate and I don't understand that. I don't understand why somebody would come and hate on a bloke who's trying to just help others not get caught. Like, man, you got a sucker punch. You've survived that. And now you're just out there preaching the good word. I just thank you so much for doing that. And I stand with you and say, well done. And I don't, I stand against somebody who wants to come and hate on you. I'm against that person for that. I, I stand beside you. I want to support you, however that looks. So if at any point in time you want to reach out and hit me up for, for something, man, I'm here. I just want to, I just want to stand with you, stand shoulder to shoulder with you and say, let's fight this fight. Let's get this good word out there and let's make sure that we're saving people's lives. So they're not getting out there just making silly mistakes and getting themselves killed or their mates killed. All right. I want to come to Australia and wheel. <laughs> ah, right. Next week, let's book the airfares. It's been my dream for a long time. I'll, yeah. I'll let you know if it ever works out. Yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to do Rubicon since that's your backyard, man. Yep. It's awesome. I need a tour guide. <laughs> my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that's so good. I'm just <laughs> glad this is happening. So now that people can understand like, my ignorance can help other people's <laughs> ignorance.
Thank you so much. That's yeah. That's, Thank that's you. Old. Well, I've certainly learned something out of this conversation and I'm sure you have as well. So let me know in the comments down below what it is you learnt from this. I'm Mad Matt. Stay safe on the trails.